Welcome to One on One. I'm Greg Bassett, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspapers. A big day here at PAC 14. They're all big. We have one of our best returning guests. She was the second ever guest that we had on this show. We always have her in January to preview the General Assembly, but she's been too busy. We've all been too busy with stuff going on, so we have her in almost mid-session or early first quarter of the session to come in and talk about what's going on. Our state senator, Mary Beth Carosa, welcome. Thanks for having me back, Greg, it's, and I have to tell you, it really is good to be back. It's so good to see you, but you are a busy bee, as you always are, uh, during these sessions. So first off, tell me what it's like in Annapolis these days. It must be a really weird experience. Well, COVID-19 has impacted all of us, and when I think back to the early adjournment back in March and how um, the session ended so abruptly and all the members returned back to their districts, and since March, it's been constituent service oriented, um, trying to assist constituents, whether it's small businesses that were forced to shut down and what type of assistance did they need to even survive, uh, whether it was people who needed help with their unemployment benefits, whether it's people just wanting to know basic information, where do I go for a COVID-19 test? When should I test? Um, you know, we're talking about all the phases with the reopenings and what you could and could not do. So um, really since March, it's been um, thousands of constituent inquiries and efforts to assist those. And that really was the precursor of preparing for this session of going back to Annapolis for the 2021 COVID-19 session. And it is completely different. Um, for starters, um, we have to test uh, two times a week before we can even go onto the Senate floor. We have to show that negative text message that, um, that we're COVID-19 free um, in order to um, keep our colleagues, staff, um, the public safe. But the good news is we have been meeting as uh, an assembly um, and moving forward. Uh, the hearings are different. All of our committee hearings are held by Zoom. And while we are covering a lot of bills, um, there are some limitations. We are having to limit the number of people who can testify both for and against a bill. And oftentimes the process um, prevents people um, from participating with oral and verbal presentations, which are far more effective than reading written testimony at times. Um, I will say that we have insisted, and I say we, um, Senate Republicans, have insisted on in-person committee voting and in-person uh, chamber and floor voting. And uh, we've been able to stick to that at this point because we have not had any outbreaks um, uh, you know, in the chambers or um, on the state house complex. So we have been able to do our committee votes and our floor votes um, in person. Um, the governor just had the state of the state last week address. Um, it kind of, that address kind of depressed me because he was, he was, there's a lot of stuff going on, obviously. Um, but you found some positive uh, things in that based on your weekly uh, letter that you send out. And among those was uh, the prospects for long-term uh, economic uh, progress. Well, first of all, I accept Governor Hogan's challenge to the members of the Maryland General Assembly, which is we need to pass the COVID-19 Emergency Relief Act as soon as possible. And I give the governor credit. Um, he came right out. He made it his top legislative priority. He put the challenge out there. The Senate has, uh, is moving forward. Uh, the House, uh, we hope, will continue the pace and that we actually have an Emergency Relief Act that will go into effect immediately. And that's really important that there, there is a sense of urgency. And I'm supporting that um, because I'm listening to my constituents. Um, you know, my constituents are telling me uh, they do need those stimulus checks, uh, 750 uh, family, 450 for individuals. Uh, they're telling me the small businesses that they do need those tax credits for uh, some immediate relief. Um, looking ahead, um, I do believe Governor Hogan um, is pointing out to us, and it's something that I've been working on throughout the entire COVID-19 pandemic, is that there will be long-term recovery needed. And we need to think about not only the short-term relief that we absolutely need for our families and for our business operators, 
but that we also need to think about what policies do we need in place for the long haul. And I'm very concerned about those small businesses, especially those operators that were already just kind of at the margins with their profits before COVID-19 hit and have been so hard hit by COVID-19 uh, that we are sensitive to what policies we move forward with. And there are some bills that have been proposed that quite frankly are taking us off of a long-term recovery track. And I'm very concerned about those. And I wanna give credit to the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce and members, the Ocean City Hotel Motel Restaurant Association, uh, those are, who are making the effort to um, share their concerns and their immediate priorities uh, and thinking about the long-term as recovery as well. One of those things is the Essential Employees uh, Protection Act or whatever it's called, I should know, but I don't. Um, there's some controversy with that. I know you're kind of pushing back against that. Well, I'm again, I'm listening to my constituents. Um, before this legislation, this legislation was, um, we caught wind that it would be introduced and it was introduced and I started hearing from um, you know, employees at Purdue um, and the leadership there. I started to hear from um, members of the local Ocean City Salisbury Chambers of Commerce. And you hear me mentioning our two chambers of commerce. It's really important that your viewers know that um, the Ocean City and Salisbury Chambers of Commerce are two of the biggest chambers in the entire state of Maryland. And I give them credit that they, um, you know, they were of course focused on the, the short-term relief that was needed um, for the very survival of their members. But then, you know, they're looking ahead and we're looking at these bills that, you know, could have a devastating impact, particularly when they're talking about some retroactive provisions um, and, and what that would cost to their businesses. Um, so I, I give them credit. We need the feedback. There is a, a hearing coming up that um, I'm already in touch with our locals about what testimony will be shared. I'm not on the committee where that, that bill is moving through. It's going through the Senate Finance Committee, but I am in contact with the members on that Finance Committee so they know um, the devastating impact of that legislation as proposed. One of the things through this uh, pandemic we've all learned, uh, it's part of our exposure uh, to Wi-Fi, to being having the, the zones where we can access stuff, kids being online. Um, we definitely have an internet problem uh, on the shore. What's going on with that? So I will have to say with every constituency that I've been working with through the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's been our students, parents, teachers in the school system, whether it's been uh, those who are depending um, on broadband to telework, uh, whether it has to do with telehealth, which has now become essential during the COVID-19 pandemic. All of those constituencies absolutely agree that the one priority that we need to make sure that we move forward with is increasing broadband accessibility. And in a district like mine, um, representing all of Somerset County, all of Worcester County, half of Wicomico County, so many rural areas, you know, from um, you know, from Smith Island to um, Newark and Worcester County. Um, you know, you look at the rural areas in Wicomico area, you know, I've got the eastern part, Pittsville and those areas. Um, the challenges um, that we have um, for um, our families, whether they are trying to work with their students, uh, their children at home and with the school system and the challenges that broadband, a lack of broadband um, accessibility has presented, um, whether it's um, trying to um, allow people to work from home and um, e even trying to make sure businesses, um, attracting businesses eventually, they, they need to be in places where they can have broadband access. And then of course to um, expanding telehealth. So all of these constituencies agree we need to increase broadband accessibility, especially in our rural areas. It's a priority not only for the uh, Senate Republican Caucus, it's been a priority for the, uh, it's a bipartisan priority, um, you know, with both Democrats and Republicans. It's a priority for Governor Hogan's administration. So I would expect to see us make some progress on that. And I'd also like to give my um, two of my colleagues on the shore credit for their leadership um, in moving broadband forward. And that's Senator Addie Eckert and Senator Steve Hershey. They've been at the forefront 
of working broadband accessibility issues and uh, their experience now is really coming in handy for the shore to push and make sure that that access is fair to the shore. I know you're close to the governor, you're a fan of the governor. Um, I, I think his performance for this thing has been really good. I, I'm really impressed with what he's done. Uh, I was skeptical about reopening schools, very worried about that. They've reopened to Wicomico today uh, to, the, to the younger kids. Um, they're going to open in stages. Um, are you concerned about reopening schools or are you supporting where he is on that? I really believe from what I'm hearing from the majority of parents and students and teachers and my interaction with our three local school systems in Wicomico, Somerset and Worcester counties that we can open safely for our students and I think it's so important on so many different levels. Number one, we have to catch up academically. Um, we have to be candid that um, this virtual learning has had um, a bit of a negative impact on our students' progress, uh, their academic performance. Also, I'm very concerned about the, the social and the developmental side of this um, when, you know, that you can, you see that students uh, need that interaction with other students and with their teachers. Um, at the same time, I really want to give credit to um, teachers and parents who have become very creative on how to make the best of a bad situation. I've seen um, some of these Zoom interactions where teachers have um, uh, really come up with creative ways to keep their students engaged. I've seen parents really have to put so much, um, make sacrifices on their end, whether it's work-wise or social-wise, really spending that time with their children. And what also has helped happen in this pro process is that parents see um, what's going on with their children's education. They have legitimate questions and concerns that they're sometimes raising with the school system. And I want to make sure with, when they're raising those questions, when they're asking for more parental involvement at the front end, that we are not defensive about that, that we realize that COVID-19 has changed the dynamics here. And perhaps we can take that as a positive. So when parents might be asking questions and maybe even challenging um, on certain uh, content or uh, processes, instead of being defensive, I'd like us to see um, us communicate more not through attorneys, not through legal memos, and not through legislation. I'd like us to communicate um, by sitting down and working through some of these tough issues. So um, there's been, I believe, a plus side with parents being more involved. I believe that that also is raising some questions that we need sometimes better systems of communications on the early end. So we're not defensive when questions are raised about um, our children's education. You had a really a great forum, I thought, that I got to participate in where you had the Senate minority, the new Senate minority leader in town. And I know you went to a lot of different locations on the Lower Shore, but the Salisbury meeting was great. You had um, a lot of the leaders here in town, and they were able to make presentations to him about what some of our problems were and what some of our pluses were. Um, and I just thought that was a, a great thing. Well, thank you. And we wanted to take advantage of the new Senate Republican minority leader being on the shore. And he initially offered to come down for one meeting, and we talked him into several stops. He did a forum in Ocean City at the Ocean City Convention Center. He did a forum here in Salisbury at the, the Wacomico Civic Center as well. And we also had a meet with a local waterman. And I thought what was especially helpful in the Salisbury Forum is that even though we had to limit the presentations, it was a really good cross-section. So the um, minority leader could hear from um, our business community. You know, he heard from the chamber, he heard from Purdue. Um, he heard from our um, local health officer, Lori Brewster, who covers two counties, um, Wicomico and Somerset. Um, you know, uh, he had an update from uh, at both the uh, K through 12 level uh, with Dr. Hanlon and also um, from uh, at the university level as well uh, with UMES participating. So I thought that was important that um, he was in listening mode 
It did give our um, leaders here, our business community and civic leaders, the opportunity to make that presentation. And I think it opened a door for a relationship, um, a, an ongoing working relationship. Um, I do plan when the leader um, after session to have him come back down and make um, additional rounds in my district. But I was very grateful, um, not only that the leader was willing to do that um, and make those local stops, um, but that I want to thank the leaders um, in uh, Wicomico and Worcester and Somerset County because it, we had to pull that together um, very quickly and I was very um, encouraged that our leaders took advantage of the opportunity. I saw the Republicans just recently released uh, for le election integrity, which is certainly a big talking point right now. Um, some proposals for some changes in how elections are conducted to make sure that there's confidence in the elections. Um, but I was worried about some of the things on that. I mean, one thing was the voter ID, which we hear all the time. But are you concerned about election integrity in Maryland? I, I get the feeling that things go pretty well here, but do you want to talk about that? Well, I want to, do, I want to talk about that in that right now there are proposals um, that have been introduced that would expand um, mail-in balloting and other um, efforts and I believe before you talk about expanding um, uh, you know on the whether it's more mail-in balloting more voting centers whatever it might be I think we first have to look and make sure that we have safeguards and so I think you can talk about safeguards when you're talking about voter integrity and I hear from so many of my constituents number one um, you know, they point out to me, if you can show an ID for everything else that you do um, in your communities, why wouldn't you show an ID when you um, go to vote? Uh, it's a safeguard um, against voter fraud. Also, because of the increase with uh, mail-in ballots um, and having that as an option, why wouldn't we have a safeguard to match the signature on the ballot, um, you know, with your registration? Why wouldn't we put that safeguard in? People want to have confidence in the system. So I think when we talk about what I believe are common sense voter integrity safeguards, um, that it makes sense to people. And you know, it, it restores some confidence. And, and yes, I do think there was some um, confidence lost um, you know, with, with the election this past um, in the primary and in the general. So if we can come forward with some Common sense, voter integrity safeguards, I do believe that it would help restore um, public confidence in our electoral system. Is there something we can do to educate people better in terms of uh, people who might be intimidated by that process and they're afraid to go to the polls and perhaps like show their ID? You know, I do think education can be a big part of it. Um, what we're doing right now, if you see, obviously in COVID-19 had an impact on this, but, you know, voters have the option of whether, you know, they will always have the option to vote by mail if that's what they want to do. Um, for those people that it was important for them to vote in person, as it was for my constituents in Smith Island, which is why I fought so hard to make sure that um, those um, residents of Smith Island, those voters, if they wanted to vote in person, they could do that. And, and we ended up giving them the option. We had to work through it locally. But I think part of it is the education that you have multiple ways that you can vote. We want to make sure whatever way you choose to vote that we are doing everything we can to have safeguards and uh, to do all we can to prevent voter fraud. I know one thing you spend a lot of time on, um, the government, governor will have these different edicts about you know, hours for restaurants and things like that, capacity, um, and then you have to sort of rally and write a letter saying, Governor, do you want to reconsider this and get people to, uh, to sort of chime in uh, with their concerns? Um, what might be the next concerns that are coming up that you guys might have to work on? Well, thank you for the question because really since March, um, I would say the two areas that I've spent the most time would be um, assisting small businesses, especially as you know, with the um, challenges of a seasonal employment and seasonal businesses um, to do all I could to help them through that process. So if you think back, first they were, many of them were shut down. Then, so that put the pressure on to provide some immediate relief so they could survive. Then we immediately started uh, pivoting to 
uh, what these phased in reopening, what would that look like and how could we do it in a way that's safe but also maybe um, speed that process along. And so there was a lot of back and forth between um, the small business operators, uh, our local chambers of commerce again, the Hogan administration. A lot was done behind the scenes um, to say, okay, we're at this point, but we really need to move to this next point and maybe faster than where the governor an initially proposed. And there was a lot of back and forth. I want to give credit to the Maryland Restaurant Association and again to uh, Bill Chambers at the Salisbury Chamber of Commerce because we had these meetings every other week and we would just do that. Okay, where are we, um, what are, what's the next step? So, you know, when we look right now, Maryland was in a stronger position when you look at these other states, especially states like, you know, New York and California, where, um, you know, they, they're either still shut down or barely open at this point. And also pushing um, for as much flexibility at the local level. Um, you know, when you started to look at the numbers, you know, if we were doing better on the shore and we could have safe reopenings, if Prince George's County and Montgomery County and those other counties wanted to make decisions to be more conservative, we just didn't want their decisions to impact us on the shore uh, where we were ready to, you know, to move forward with safe reopening. So um, that is continuing right now. Um, what I'm hearing the most from our um, Salisbury um, and Ocean City Chambers of Commerce and the Ocean City Hotel Motel Restaurant Association is they are pushing for a civil immunity bill to give them some protection if they have put the COVID-19 safeguards in place um, that they are protected from frivolous lawsuits which even um, having a lawsuit filed against you could potentially put you out of business. And I'm hearing right now, um, because we're in session and trying to move that legislation forward, I'm a co-sponsor of that. Senator Chris West, who's on the Senate Judicial Proceedings Committee, is the lead. I am his um, principal co-sponsor, and we're um, trying to provide some relief for our businesses on that front. I have to ask you, you've had a really distinguished career. You've, you've worked in Congress, um, you worked in the State House, in the Governor's Office, you've been a delegate, now a Senator. You were in the Pentagon working for the Defense Department on the day that 9-11 happened. So you've been really well-rounded and exposed to a lot of things in government. And those of us who worked in Washington, worked on Capitol Hill, um, certainly were affected by what happened on January 6th. What, what were your thoughts that day? What were you, at first I was watching and I was like, well, this isn't going to be a big deal. And then it, it became a big deal. Um, it was just stunning to me to watch that, having an intimate feeling about that building. Um, very sad, um, very painful. Uh, I, what immediately came to mind were my friends, um, you know, that uh, were working in the Capitol, literally in the Capitol and in the, the House and Senate um, office buildings, um, concern for their safety. Um, you know, you're, the lawmakers, um, the staff, the um, law enforcement. And, and, and to a certain extent, it was heartbreaking um, to see that, um, knowing that I, know, I knew of people that came up from the shore to peacefully participate and weren't even anywhere near the Capitol and didn't even know that was going on. And then to see that happen um, is, you know, I describe it as, um, you know, sad, um, painful, and, um, and I condemn the actions of those um, who, you know, violently were storming the Capitol. And um, I know the investigations are going forward and they should be held accountable, absolutely. And, um, and I hope we can move forward. You're very policy oriented. I've known you for many years. You're, you're more about the, the, the policy and what government can do and, and stay out of as opposed to the personality. But this political personality stuff, the name calling and the anger, uh, does that, how does that affect you? How do you feel about it? Um, just when, you, when you're with constituents and they might do some name calling, how do you get them to focus on policy and really to understand how a bill becomes a law and things like that? Well, I start with the fact that I represent um, District 38 in the Senate um, at the state of Maryland. So I first try to educate people that I can be helpful to them at the state level. And that what I try to do is make sure that I understand the priorities of my constituents. And then from a policy standpoint, I look at it from how can I assist my 
constituents. Sometimes it's just good basic constituent casework and that's what um, my team and I try to do day in day out. Um, sometimes it's a policy that is being misinterpreted and so you have to work with the uh, whether it's the um, current administration which is the Hogan administration now or whether it's um, working with your colleagues um, in the legislature um, to see if we have some flexibility on interpretation that could help your constituents. I tend to take a pretty narrow approach uh, when it comes to actually um, introducing legislation. I have to be convinced that legislation is needed, that it, have we tried to resolve the issue, um, the policy issue um, by other means, and if we have not been successful um, in doing that at that level, will it require a legislative fix? And if it does, I, my approach has been to keep it as narrow as possible so you can be successful um, in moving forward on that policy. So I, I try to work very closely with my constituents on both the education, the communications, and make sure I understand the shared priorities and then have a strategy on how to move forward. And sometimes you have to say, no, it doesn't take legislation. It takes um, a reinterpretation of the policy. Or yes, it does take legislation, but it's very, very narrow in its focus. So that's what I try to do. And it means um, I need to hear from my constituents. So having them not come up during the session has been difficult, but we're taking advantage of um, Zoom meetings. Um, the Eastern Shore delegation is still meeting every Friday morning by Zoom and I encourage uh, my constituents to be part of that and I also just continue to encourage them to contact uh, me through my email, um, you know, my website and I want to be accessible to them even though it's much more challenging during a COVID-19 session. What are your hopes for the next phase in all this? So my mom has always taught me to be optimistic, so you know that will continue. Um, I do look at this right now. Um, we are working through the COVID-19, our recovery, and so I, that's why I agree with Governor Hogan to keep the focus there. We have tremendous challenges right now with um, a supply issue with the vaccines. I believe, though, that we will stay on track with that. Um, I would um, think that the more people that are vaccinated, the more we recover. Uh, as we recover um, on that end, on the health end, I want to make sure then we're also um, recovering on the business end. And again, I, I expect um, it to be a bright future and hoping to see um, everybody come back to the shore for their vacations and for their retreats. And I, I will stay optimistic. She's Mary Beth Carrozzo. She's our state senator. She works really hard for everyone out there. And we're thrilled that she had time to be this here today. Thanks so much for being here, Senator. Thanks, and I look forward to coming back after session. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent newspaper, another edition of 101, right here on PAC 14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.